طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so this is the the first uh, set of slides and um, um, of course these slides are originally the, the the slides that are distributed with the textbook but um, of course I have done some modification to these slides um, so that's what I'm going to post on blackboard so basically the objective of this part is just to uh, review the basic concepts which is good for people who are not you know who didn't take four five five in the last month and two or three years um, they need to refresh some of these concepts so that's a good uh, overview and also to unify the, te the terminology because some people have addressed certain uh, 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 notions in networking in a different in a different way so we need to uh, unify the terminology that we will use throughout the course in different layers so um, whatever terminology that we will discuss here uh, is going to be used throughout the course in terms of an overview we'll discuss um, what is an internet what is the internet what, what 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 is the internet composed of what is the definition of network what is the definition of a protocol from a, a very basic uh, point of view and uh, we'll discuss the uh, issue of uh, network that does the network has really an edge and uh, what is um, uh, 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 what, what, what is, how can I ident identify the network edge or the network access or the physical media and so on? The network core, what is used as part of the network core? How do I measure the performance uh, uh, of a network? And, uh, and uh, what is the protocol layer and service uh, models that are used as part of the internet? <coughs> Including uh, the the TCP IP reference model. And why do we need to have a reference model in the first place? Why do I need, why do I need to have a layered uh, model? Um, so this introduction, of course, does not focus on, on a certain layer. So we'll, we'll talk about all the layers in, as part of this overview. So the uh, next chapter, we'll discuss the application layer and we'll start zooming into the application layer and what protocols are, are, are used as part of the application layer, and then transport layer, and so on. Okay, but here in the overview, we'll talk about all the network architecture in general, not focusing on a certain layer per se. So what is the internet, first of all? The internet is, uh, we, we can define the internet in three different uh, uh, angles. So the internet, in terms of nuts and bullets, it's like, you have a car, the car is really composed of certain nuts and bullets, which means that you have some uh, nuts, bullets, you have some wheel, you know, frame, you have this and that. So we'll talk about everything separately. Okay, later on we'll connect the car by connecting these nuts and bullets, we'll put together the car in terms of an actual uh, network, physical network, and then later on, we'll discuss the definition in terms of what does this network actually do? What services or applications can this network provide to me? Okay. So in terms of, so in terms of nuts and bullets, we have, of course, uh, uh, the networks in terms of uh, PCs, servers, wireless laptops, cell phone, these are the end devices. So we have devices like iPad, like my cell phone, laptop, these are end devices, okay? So that's one component. We have network devices in terms of, we have cell towers, um, we have access points, um, we have, uh, 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 for example, routers, switches, and so on. We have communication links, whether these communication links are uh, copper-based, like UTP, STP, uh, like the, the, these network cables, per se, or we have like coaxial cable, like the one that we use for TVs and stuff, or like fiber cables that we nowadays use in our home network, okay? So these are physical uh, or communication 
uh, links or media that we use. Of course, we can use no media, in which case we use wireless. Um, that's one of the physical media that we talk about, except that it's, everything is, is, is transmitted through the air. So there's no actual copper or fiber optic cable in that case. But you know, we use the air as our uh, medium to transfer uh, uh, wireless uh, signals. Okay, so if we put together these components in a certain way, we form the internet as we see it today. But we have to connect them using certain rules. These are the rules that we talk that we will talk about. <clears throat> so, in a nutshell, we have we have uh, end systems or end uh, 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 devices. We have communication links in terms of physical communication links, whether it's fiber, copper and so on. And we have routers and switches. These are what we call network devices. These are not used for, uh, for initiating any traffic. These are used to facilitate the traffic forwarding inside the network. Okay? But we use the end devices to, uh, to initiate traffic. Okay? In terms of physical view, that's how the network looks like. We connect end devices in a bunch of different ways, whether it's using wireless, in which case we use like a, a mobile uh, or, or a cell phone tower like this, okay? Um, and we call this an access network. Access network is the, is the network that I use to uh, get an entry point to the internet which, in which case we can use Ethernet, we can use Wi-Fi, we can use Wi-Fi or wireless LANs, we can use uh, 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 sensor networks, we can use whatever, okay? So this, this is the, the first access network that I use as an entry point to the internet, okay? And then this is what we call the core network. The core network is, uh, composed of set of routers and switches and stuff, network devices and physical links which are connected together to carry out the traffic from all the access networks and move the traffic, the aggregated traffic from all the access networks and move it to uh, another place, geographical place that will then uh, move through the core network to go to another access network for reception, for someone to receive it, okay? So this is the physical view. So the internet uh, 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 is the, uh, the interconnection of smaller networks. From the name, it's internet. It's the inter-networking of multiple networks each of which is composed of some uh, nuts and bullets that we talked about, whether it's physical links, uh, network devices, end devices, and so on. Okay? Um, so the internet is basically a network of networks, which are connected all together. And we have the concept of uh, 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 internet and intranet. Okay? The intranet is nothing but, you know, um, a, logical, a logical network <clears throat> that, can, that can be localized geographically or it can span across different geographical locations. So the intranet is subset of the internet which uses some security aspects to make this network private. So the intranet is, so the, sorry, the, the, the intranet is, uh, is a small network. By small, we don't mean small geographically, but it's a subset of the internet which uses uh, security aspects that make, makes the traffic across this network private. Like the traffic of the uh, uh, intranet can flow across all these routers and switches but nobody else can see what's being communicated across uh, this intranet, even 
if it flows or it goes through the same router. So even if the traffic is going through these routers, nobody can see what's being communicated. But if we talk about internet with no security, then anyone can tap into any of these links and sniff the information and uh, make it public and uh, you can see it and you can hack into the traffic and know whatever information that you're not supposed to know. But the intranet uh, uses some, like if you're familiar with tunneling techniques, some IP security and so on and so forth, which allows the traffic over this intranet to be private and not exposed to the public. Okay? That's why we call it private intranet. Even if it uses the same infrastructure, the same uh, physical devices. The most important thing on the internet, which we don't, it's not tangible, we don't actually see it, is what we call the standards. And uh, standards define what we call protocols. Protocol is a set of rules that govern the communication between the, the devices in the, in the internet. You know, there is a protocol that routers use to communicate to each other. There is a protocol that the end device uses to communicate with the access point or with the cell tower or, um, or across a switch or across a router or anything. Okay? So the protocol is nothing but a, a, a set of rules that are well-defined in details to uh, govern how the communication is going to happen. More specifically, so there is the service view, which is, okay, what, what, what does this car do actually? What, what service does this car provide to me? Well, I can use the car to move from one place to another, right? So the definition in terms of a service view, so we know the physical view now. The physical view is that we have links, we can connect them using access network, we can use intranet, we can use internet, we connect, we hook up these links together with a router and so on. We have an actual physical view, okay? How, how and in what sense can I use this physical view to provide any service for me? How can I move from one place to another using this physical view? That's what we talk about now. So this communication infrastructure enables us through the use of protocols to provide set of services. These set of services can be in a form of web browsing, in a form of actual application, voice over IP, emails, games, video, audio, uh, make phone calls, whatever. Okay? And these services are the main motivation for us to, to really study that topic or to build uh, uh, the, the internet the way it is uh, nowadays. And these communication services can be provided in a reliable way or unreliable way. Like if you're familiar with TCP. So TCP provides reliable communication. Why? Because in certain applications, you need some reliability. For example, if I, if I want to transfer a zip file from one place to another, okay, uh, 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 this delivery has to be reliable because the zip file, if I lose one part of the zip file, I won't be able to reconstruct the data inside this archive, right? I won't be able to really extract uh, 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 the files inside that zip file. So you try to extract the zip file, it tells you, the file is corrupted. You cannot get anything out of it. So I lost the whole thing because it's just one simple packet or one simple part inside that zip file. So in which case, using a reliable communication like TCP is very important. It's not an option. Versus if we talk about video application, like video streaming. Actually, reliability might be an overkill, and it might be a, a big overhead that you cannot afford. For example, if you're, if you're watching a, a, a football game, and 
um, you know, in the scene, you have one or two pixels that have been lost because of one packet that has not been delivered on time. Will this be an issue for you? Probably not, right? On the other hand, if I, have, if I want to be reliable, I have to retransmit, I have to wait for this information to be retransmitted, in which case you may encounter some delays, right? Uh, and in that case, you will not play the whole frame because of these two pixels, right? So in that case, you, you, you run into scenarios like, you know, the frame is pausing or uh, uh, you don't have real actual quality in the video because you want to make it reliable, you want to make it high quality and stuff. But in doing this, you jeopardize the real timeness of the application, which is critical. That's why in video applications, especially in, 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 in streaming, particularly on YouTube and, and things like that, it's not advisable to use TCP. Actually, in most of these applications, they use different, different protocols in the transport layer to not to provide reliability for packet loss, but to provide actual quality of service in terms of, in terms of small delays. In, in other words, video applications are very sensitive to delay, but they are not very sensitive to packet loss. Web browsing the other, is the other way around. Web browsing is, is very much tolerant to delays because, I mean, if you click on google.com and the page comes up in two seconds or five seconds, it's okay, right? You will not feel that big of a difference, right? But if it comes up with graphics that's totally lost, then you feel like there's something missing. Or you're transferring like a zip file and the zip file loses one certain you know, part of it, then you will not be able to recover the whole file. That's a big issue. So usually web browsing or uh, delivery of uh, 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 um, certain reliable data is not very sensitive in terms of delay, but it's very sensitive in terms of uh, 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 packet loss. And for video applications, for video streaming, it's the other way around. So the internet has to be designed for both. Because guess what? I mean, in the past, people have been using the, uh, 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 um, the telephone network. In the, in the past, people have been using the telephone network. The telephone network provides very reliable voice calls. When they started using this network for data transfer, for actual data transfer, and we'll talk about this, they found that the performance is really, really bad. It's not efficient. Okay. So they started to come up with the internet concept which leverages the concept of packet switching. We'll talk about this. For packet switching, it's, it's more efficient. But again, for packet switching, there is something missing. And they started to converge towards an internet with some quality of service techniques that allows the internet to provide different types of services video, audio, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's why we have Skype today. We have Skype for voice calls. We have video streaming. Of course, Skype is not as high quality as you know, uh, uh, phone calls. But at least you can do a lot of you know, uh, uh, voice services for free on the actual internet, which is a big achievement. And through the, the different, through providing different services in terms of reliable, unreliable, in terms of uh, best effort for data delivery and so on, we'll talk about these in details. So these are some of the services that will allow you to provide multiple services and applications that, uh, that have different characteristics on the same network. Because way in the past, People design the network based on the service. So we have telephone network, and we have data network. Okay, So that's the model in the past. But now, there is the concept of convergence. 
Now we have Uridu, they provide all types of services, even TV at home, right? They provide uh, Loa Esmui, triple play, they provide video, audio, um, data, everything is provided on the same network, using the same network. This is not done only by devices. This requires a huge amount of intelligence in terms of techniques and standards and protocols, which is the most important component on the internet, okay, that can facilitate this diversity of services which allows all these applications to use the same network, and which is good for service providers because then a service provider can leverage the same network to provide different applications, which means good revenue, right? So the more diverse my applications are, uh, the more revenue, the more subscribers, more users, the network users will grow, and then the revenue will grow. Using the same infrastructure, I don't have to use you know, different infrastructures for different services and applications. And this is a very important concept that people have uh, uh, started to focus on nowadays, which is conversions of the internet. We have the internet infrastructure, use it. We, we could not uh, uh, use the network infra the internet infrastructure for voice calls a few years back, but now we can. And it's getting better and better, right? And we need to strengthen that. Okay? So, so what's a protocol? Well, as we said, protocol is the, protocols are the most important component on the internet, which is, not, which is something that we don't see. We see actual routers, switches, and stuff, but protocol we don't see. Yet, it's the most important thing. If two people are trying to communicate together, you know, um, you have like a, 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 well, a Japanese man w w wanting to talk to an Arab guy, they won't be able to talk, right? Uh, someone will do this and someone will expect to shake hands. You know, they will panic. They will not be able to communicate together. Someone will talk Japanese, someone will talk Arabic. They will not be able to communicate. But if there is a certain protocol that they both, they both know it, they are aware of that protocol, which means that, you know, we're both Arabs, so we, we have, you know, more or less close culture. So we know that once we see each other, we shake hands, okay, we, 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 we say salam alaikum or something like this, and then we start talking. And then when we talk, we have certain, you know, rules in, in talking, okay. Um, so we talk the same language, we'll be able to communicate. Messages and, 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 and speech will get across bidirectionally. So the protocol is a set of rules that govern this communication. Without you know, these set of rules, both parties would not be able to communicate. And that applies to every single device on the internet. If a device does not know a certain protocol, the device will not be able to communicate with others using that protocol because it's not implemented. So again, the um, uh, uh, human protocols will actually go into certain questions, question, answer, and so on. Okay, uh, we start by salam, and then we we start to uh, to talk. Same thing on the network. So we um, before two devices uh, start talking, they need to they need to know how they can talk. Okay, uh, there is the concept of connection establishment. So this is like I'm telling you, salam alaikum. Do you want to talk now? Something like this. And then you answer, yes, I can talk. And then and only then, I start asking you something and then you can answer. <clears throat> right? Same thing applies to network devices. Network devices need to establish connection before they can send messages. And then when they send messages, they have to agree on the format of this message. If I don't know the format of the message that you're sending to me, I won't be able to process it. In which case, I won't be able to understand anything. Okay? So that's what the protocol uh, uh, used for. So protocols define the format 
order of messages sent and received among network entities. And that applies, as I said, to every single network device. End devices, intermediary devices, cell towers, routers, switches, everything. Some protocols are specific uh, to the medium that is used. For example, if you, if you use fiber optic, you need specific protocol. If you remove optic, fiber optics and use, for example, UTP or STP, something like this, then you need another set of protocols. Some protocols are really agnostic to whatever medium you, you use, like TCP. TCP doesn't care whether you're using wireless, wired, fiber optics, TCP, UDP, doesn't care. It's used for anything. Although, in, in, in wireless, it has a very bad performance. We may, we may talk about why, but, um, but in general, it doesn't care about the medium. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so any, any, any questions so far? So that's in a nutshell the so that's how the protocol looks like so uh, so this is a human protocol so you say hi I say hi okay so it's like we agree on start to communicate if I tell you for example I'm, I have another appointment I have to leave then I don't I don't want to talk then we disconnect but that's how we how we agree how we uh, 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 we use the protocol as a human same thing here we establish TCP connection. I have to send an, a connection request first, and then the other device has to send me an acknowledgement that I agree to communicate. And only then I can send some uh, data, whether this is like HTTP request or uh, video uh, or audio data or something like this. Okay? So that's, that's a very uh, important concept, is to uh, uh, define and understand what protocol is uh, 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 as part of the internet. Okay, so we'll take the different parts of the network and now we'll, we'll, we'll zoom in and talk about um, each part. So we have network edge, which is the access network that we talked about, which is our, in, our entry point to the internet. What are the types, different types of this access network? And, and then later on, the core network, because the internet has access network and core network, right? So we'll talk about a, a, a network edge. What are the different technologies in this network edge or access network? And what are the different technologies or uh, paradigms in the core network? Okay? So uh, the network edge talks about, you know, facilitating the uh, how the applications, in terms of uh, uh, hosts and, and stuff, how they, uh, they initiate traffic over the internet. Okay? And uh, uh, in this access network, in, in any network course that you, have mi you might have taken before, you talked about, like for example, technologies like Ethernet as an access network technology. Okay? Uh, and you may have talked about uh, wireless access networks, like wireless LAN, like this is an access point. So that's another <clears throat> access network technology. Okay? But nowadays we have a lot more. Like, for example, we have fiber to the home. We have fiber optics at home. That's another access network that we did not use before. Fiber uh, was used more in, in, in the core network but people started to use it even in the, in the network edge, in the, in the access network, which is, which is something that we started to use recently. Okay? So we'll discuss the architecture of, of, uh, of optical-based access networks. Um, so, <clears throat> so the network edge is composed of end devices, of course. So we have... Uh, uh, end systems like um, hosts or laptops or cell phones and stuff. And these run different applications like uh, web, emails, video, audio, things like this. And then this uh, uh, application 
information needs to be delivered over the network. They, they get to be delivered on the network uh, as an application using two different models. We have what we call the client-server model, and we have the peer-to-peer -peer model. Um, who is familiar with, with the difference between the two? Anyone is familiar with the difference between the two? Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. In the server mode, where you have a, a central mode, let's say, which is the server, and uh, all the nodes are trying to access it to get the information, and mm -hmm. it's pretty much central. In the peer to peer model, actually, uh, the information is spread across the network, and the uh, end nodes practically communicate with each other to get the. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So, <clears throat> so client server model, you always have a client. The client initiates everything. It initiates the communication. Uh, it starts to request a service from a server. The server is a centralized entity that hosts all the information, and it provides the service for you to either uh, uh, consume certain information, like for example FTP, I want to download a file from an FTP server. I want to display a web page from a web server. I want to uh, watch a video from a video server. Okay? But I am always the client who initiates the communication. I request the service. Okay? For peer-to-peer, -peer, the information, as Khalid said, is actually scattered. It's not hosted in a specific centralized entity. Rather, it's scattered across different nodes. We call them peers. Okay? And then each one has a, a software that kind of crawls or you know, it, it, it searches for your information across all these peers. Okay? And here we say the peer to peer uses minimal, and minimal D yani, is, is really underlined, because peer to peer has a centralized component. Peer to peer is not fully distributed, it, it's actually partially distributed and partially centralized. In some cases, it's, um, it's totally distributed, but the distributed systems have very, very inefficient performance. Because if you have the information really scattered with no uh, clue for you where the information is, the only way for you to get this information is by doing what? Exhaustive search. Exhaustive search. You will have to go to the first peer. Do you have this information? No, you have to go to another peer. You have this information, no, you have third peer, you have this information, no. You will have to do an exhaustive search. But what typically people use is that, and that's, that's the, the concept that's used even on, on Skype and BitTorrent and everything. We don't store the information in the centralized server. We store where the information is on the server. So when you as a peer open your software, the software connects to the server. It still connects to a server. And the server knows that this peer with this set of files is now online. That's it. The, the server does not host the actual information on it, but it knows that the one that has this information is online. That's it. And what information do you have? So if I want to consume a certain file, I connect to the server to know which peer has this file. And then I do a peer-to-peer -peer connection directly using TCP to download that file from that, uh, uh, from, that, uh, from that node. So in other words, if we were to, just to demonstrate the capability of this, if we were to, uh, to draw the two architectures, so we can, um, so 
in the in this client server model we have um, clients and we have a server in the in the middle okay and they all connect to the server for both to know the if the file exists on the server or not, and if, if they find the, the file on the server, the actual content of the file on the server, they, then they download it. Okay? For peer-to-peer, -peer, when you, uh, if this is like peer-to-peer, -peer, the software will connect on the server, and then when you request a certain file, here, I get only the location of the file. So the location of the file is, a, is let's say, on this peer. Then I will do another session, peer-to-peer -peer directly, without involving the server. Okay? Using uh, TCP, using any, anything. So that connection is not part of the client-server connection, on the uh, uh, client-server architecture at all. So the peer-to-peer -peer divides the job into two things. We have the location of the information, which we can know through the server using traditional methods. Once we know the location, then we connect peer-to-peer -peer directly to that node to fetch the information. And that's a very intelligent, uh, intelligent concept because in the past, people really uh, were able to get through all the infringement of the, of the copyrights and stuff like that by saying, you know, we don't host any information. No one consumes the information from us. Now, what we host here is the location of the information. They give it to us and we host it, but we don't really host the actual information. Therefore, we don't infringe or we don't have any violation to any copyrights. So they were able to get through this for a number of years and until, until just recently when they started to have a new, new laws that really address this issue. So this peer-to-peer -peer is just a simple concept, but it's very, very, very uh, scalable and um, very uh, powerful. <clears throat> okay. So in fact, all types of messengers or um, like Skype or Windows Messenger, they use the same concept. So when I chat with someone, um, I get the, the, the location of that person in terms of IP address and, and how I connect to that person from the Skype server or from the Windows server or from Yahoo server or from... Once I know this information, I connect directly to the person. I don't need the server anymore. And I connect directly to... Uh, to the person okay. using the peer-to-peer -peer architecture. So these are two different uh, concepts um, that, uh, that are used nowadays. Uh, and actually, understanding these concepts will help us really understand how some of the access networks are designed, because it's very interesting. When they design, for example, ADSL, ADSL is like uh, a technology in the access network. And we all used to use ADSL in our home network, like in terms of physical media. What is the relation between the access network and the model of client server or peer-to-peer? -peer? Actually, this, these architectures influence the way you design the access networks. Because, for example, DSLs, they call them ADSLs, or Asymmetric Digital Subscriber Lines. So access networks, in terms of physical medium, you can use um, wireless. You can use something like um, cell towers using 3G, 4G. You can use Ethernet and different technologies. In our home network, we use um, ADSL. We used to use ADSL. Most of us now, we use, alhamdulillah, fiber to home or some very sophisticated technologies. But we used to use ADSL before, right? 
So we'll discuss the in, in terms of re residential access networks or institutional access networks or mobile access networks. So we'll discuss ADSL and then we'll, we'll probably stop at this point. So for example, ADSL. ADSL talks about asymmetric digital subscriber line. And this was influenced a great deal with the client server model because in the past, the client server model was the predominant on the internet. The client initiates the communication and it always consumes or downloads information from the server, right? In that case, the client sends less information, so receives huge amount of information. Yani I send a request to download a file. The request is very small. I want this file. And then I download the content of that file, right? Which is a significant amount of data. So the actual data that I send to the server is not comparable with the actual data that I consume from the server. That's why ADSL has been designed with this mentality. It's called asymmetric digital subscriber line. That the downstream data rates is much higher than the upstream. That's why it's called asymmetric. Okay? <clears throat> and the idea of the DSL is, 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 is really simple yet powerful. So we have, the idea is that we already have a very well-established telephone network, right? We have telephone network in place. Uh, most of us, even though we have the most sophisticated technologies in terms of devices at home, but we still use the telephone line, the landline, at least 90% of the people we still use landlines until today, right? We did not get rid of it. Of course, some of us did, but uh, we still use it until today. We still use landlines. So the landline network is well established and well distributed across all uh, uh, homes. So the idea is that how can we leverage this network for data transfer? Well, we have to understand certain physical characteristics of uh, 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 the voice. Well, our voice, our voice, <clears throat> in terms of uh, uh, frequency characteristics, spans from zero hertz all the way to four kilohertz. Above, yeah, if you if you analyze the the, the voice signal itself. The highest frequency component in our natural voice is 4 kilohertz. Above that, we call it ultrasound or some unhearable voice. Okay? So the telephone line itself, in terms of physical medium, is really used to carry a signal with a full bandwidth of 4 kilohertz. Okay? Actually, this uh, telephone line can carry a bandwidth of really 20 megahertz or something like this. Or at least in the, in the, in the tens of megahertz. Okay? So the actual telephone line, in terms of yani, physical copper and so, uh, it can carry signal with higher frequency. <clears throat> so we can we can what we could do is that we can get the data that we have use what we call DSL modem which is what we use to use at home this DSL modem what it does is that it shifts the data itself in the frequency domain above 4 kilohertz So you have, you have the frequency uh, uh, analysis of the signal. You have the first from, from, from four or zero hertz 
all the way to 4 kilohertz, this is a voice. And our voice cannot generate more than 4 kilohertz by any chance. So very high quality voice is 4 kilohertz in terms of bandwidth. So from 4 kilohertz to 50 kilohertz, they use this for upstream. So this is for upstream communication. This is from upstream meaning that from this device to the service provider. This is what we call upstream. And upstream, knowing that this is actually a, in 90% or 99% of the time, this is client. This is used as a client. So the upstream is not, is not that huge. Because typically and usually, servers are hosted in, 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 um, in like institution or big organizations. But usually at home, our devices are consumers or they, they work as client most of the time. <clears throat> okay? And then from 50 kilohertz to all the way to one megahertz. This is for downstream. So you have a bandwidth of about maybe um, uh, 46 kilohertz for upstream, and from 50 kilohertz all the way to 1 megahertz is used for downstream, which creates this unbalance, this asymmetry. So the downstream is really huge in terms of bandwidth, and that's why you have the upstream is the upstream theoretical data rates cannot be more than one megahertz. And typically, today, typically, it's less than 256. That's why we have Hatta 256 is the actual announced rate that Uridu can give you. This is the old plan on ADSL. The first level was 256 kilohertz. This is the actual throughput that you can get. This is for upstream. For downstream, you can get easily one megabits uh, uh, per second, which is asymmetric. And that was influenced because of the, the client server architecture. So nowadays, uh, of course, with the evolution and proliferation of peer-to-peer -peer architectures, they started to, to, to use the mentality of more symmetric traffic. So in fiber optics, you start to see some upstream and downstream, which is yeah, closer to each other. In which case, uh, many of our home network devices can easily work on a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network, and, uh, uh, and it can be used as um, host for information, and you can exchange information on a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, architecture. Okay. Any, uh, any questions? So this is, uh, this is how the access networks are designed, and we'll see some other types for access networks, like using fiber or using different uh, 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 access network uh, technologies. But I thought we can, we can just stop here today, rather than just you know, pouring you with lots of information on the, on the first day. So Go ahead. I just didn't get why the upstream is low and the downstream. Because of the client-server uh, architecture, people have been influenced so much by the client-server architecture. In the client-server architecture, <clears throat> you act as a client. You are the information consumer. Okay? And the server downloads, or you, you request to download information from the server. You don't work as information publisher or host for information. Typically, the server, which is usually run in big organizations or institutions. Like we, we in 90% of the time, we connect to servers in Qatar University, in servers in here or there, which you connect to Skype, you connect to the, in 99% in of the time, we work as clients, okay? So they, they, they could have, you know, designed the, uh, the frequency spectrum to be symmetric. 
they had all the flexibility, but they, saw, they thought they have the bandwidth from you know, 4 kilohertz all the way to 1 megahertz. Rather than dividing this equally, okay, they, they thought about the client-server architecture and they said that we might as well increase the downstream because 99% of the time we are information consumers, especially at home, okay, rather than making them equal. So in that case, we, we download a lot, but the upload is a... Hatta uh, peer-to-peer in many cases, you see when, when, when you download, I'm not sure if some, some of you have noticed it, but even for peer-to-peer, -peer, you, you, um, you encounter, you always see this, that the download speed is higher, and uh, when people download things from your uh, device, it's slow. And, uh, and the downstream is higher, why? Because you, download from, you can download from multiple nodes at the same time. You, don't, you can download from multiple peers at the same time. So the downstream will be an aggregation from multiple nodes. Okay? So you can use the, the asymmetric concept to download from multiple peers. And in the upload, they, they consume information from you only. So they take the information from your uh, 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 um, host. And in that case, the upload stream will be much slower. You got you got the point. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> so feel free to interact or, or or interrupt at any point in time. You want to make this yeah, in terms of communication bidirectional rather than just client server. Um, we want to make this more peer to peer and and more interaction. Okay. So, Christina, uh, 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 record this. So. The way for me to use it for telephone calls, so telephone calls, this is the normal thing, okay? So what I did here is that I take the actual data in terms of, uh, in terms of physical signal, okay? And then this signal will go to the ADSL, the ADSL model, model will, 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 will shift the signal in the frequency domain to make it look like this, upstream and downstream, okay? So this way, it will not interfere with the voice. Even you can send two signals at the same time, but on two different frequencies, and they will not interfere with, with each other, right? You know this? Or? You can send two signals at the same time, but they are on two different frequencies. Well, that's why we have TV channels, we have, and they are not interfering with each other. <laughs> How can you, we listen to Al Jazeera or sports or something like this, and they are not interfering with each, other, with each other? They are sent on different frequencies. So you can easily send two signals at the same time, but on two different frequencies, and they will not interfere. And in the server, in the, in the receiver side, sorry, in the receiver side, what we use is like a simple filter. A filter will will allow us to filter the signal in a certain frequency band and then recover this signal and listen to it. That's what we do. Okay? High pass and low pass filters and so on. Right? So, so the idea here is that to take this signal, shift it in the frequency domain, not to interfere with the voice signal. So now they are separate. And, and then I merge this using the splitter. The splitter here can, uh, can be used from the service provider to split the two signals, one to go to the telephone, if it's voice calls, yani we use, basically we use low pass filter here, to, uh, uh, to send the voice signal to the phone. And then we use band pass filter to send the actual signal, the data signal, to the DSL modem. The DSL modem will do what? Will do the reverse operation. We'll take this signal, we'll shift it back to the baseband to make it a uh, 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 data signal again, and then it will go to the device. The device knows how to deal with the signal in the, in the baseband, in the zero, in the, in the low frequency. 
But if I, say, if I send a signal in the low frequency, it will interfere with the voice calls. So I will not be able to separate the two. But using this simple idea, using the DSL model, I, 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 all I need to do is just to shift the signal. On the way back, I shift it back. That's it. Is that clear or not? So that's the, uh, and this is what we call DSL axis uh, uh, multiplexing or axis multiplexer. So the multiplexer will again will take the signal. This is by at the at the uh, at the service provider. Yani when it goes to Uridu, what Uridu will do is that it will take this signal again will split the data and send it over the core network to the routers and, and switches that are used for data, and then we'll split the actual telephone to send it over the telephone network, if both are separate. Because in some cases, I can use one core network for both, and we'll talk about this. But uh, in normal scenarios, if you have two uh, core networks designed for uh, telephone separately from the actual routers and switches that are used for data, then you have to use a splitter at the service provider. So what I gained in that case is that in my home network, I used the, the telephone line that I used to use only for telephone calls. Now I use it for data as well. And I can get internet access through that. Fumadi? 